And now, the best 60-ish seconds of your week. As we roll on into week, however many of the lockdown shut down as a result of the Wuhan flu, I continue to need a haircut. And one of the things that's become very interesting is why aren't we able to get haircuts? Because there are an awful lot of people, very small businesses, that depend on their livelihood to cut hair, but they can't do it. Why? Because they have state licenses and governors in some states have threatened to put these people permanently out of business by taking away their license. That raises an interesting question, which is why should state governments be licensing people that cut hair for crying out loud? For those of you that think that maybe that gets you a better haircut, check the mirror. The recent real issue with all of this licensure stuff, or at least a lot of it is, that it's to keep out competition. And so certain professions or occupations want professional or occupational licensure as a means to keep out the quote unquote riffraff, which really means competitors. But once they get the license, what comes with it? regulation. And then you'll hear an endless account of over-regulation, unnecessary regulation, burdensome regulation, etc. So just something to think about when somebody says, gee, we really ought to license doing whatever. And that, of course, leads us to one of the interesting topics of the day, which is the role that experts should play in deciding public policy. Thank God we live in a constitutional republic where the people govern through their elected representatives, not through unelected bureaucrats, scientific experts, or otherwise. And for those, as we're going through this Wuhan flu epidemic or pandemic, uh, constantly cry out to trust the science. I mean, we always heard that with climate change and other things. Trust the science, as if science was a precise and exact thing. We all know it isn't question I constantly ask is, which scientists, because they don't all agree, and which they, because their opinions shift sometimes like the wind. But now you've got Greta Thunberg, the climate change child advocate, being brought in as a medical expert to discuss the Wuhan flu. If the media doesn't want us to laugh, why do they do this stuff? You've just got to ask, what's going on? Is the world truly coming to an end? And here's a little piece out of the news having to do with neither politics nor business, but rather science, something way, way, way beyond my pay grade. But it was interesting to note that this week, NASA scientists and researchers in Antarctica told us that they may, underline may, have discovered a parallel universe, something that's been talked about for ages, particularly if you're into science fiction literature, which I'm not. But they tell us that they may have come upon certain properties, antimatter or whatever, that suggest that the laws of physics that we know would be completely turned on their head, i.e. time moving backwards. And at least one of the theories says that the center of the earth could be nuclear and it's all going to blow to kingdom come one of these times. So maybe the world really is coming to an end. And the world lost two notables this week. First, Annie Glenn, the widow of the late Senator John Glenn, the first American into space, who at age 77, imagine that, went back into space. Annie Glenn died at age 100. A great woman in her own right, she championed the cause of stuttering and speech impediments. And as someone who used to be a stutterer, I thank her for that a lot. She overcame it. Thank God I was able to as well. Although you still, every once in a while, catch a little bit of it in me. Uh, Annie Glenn passing on at age 100. And Ken Osmond left the world this week. Now, you say, who is that? Better known as Eddie Haskell. And for those of the age of Leave it to Beaver, who could ever forget his unctuous behavior, especially with Mrs. Cleaver, Eddie Haskell, who put little Beaver up to so many bad tricks, passed on this week as well. And it's Memorial Day weekend when we truly observe the fallen who gave up the last full measure for all of us. Typically, it's been the traditional start or unofficial start of summer. Probably not that this year, given the lockdown that too many folks continue to be in. But Memorial Day gives us an opportunity to pause and give thanks and observe the fact that so many gave so much and some gave it all for us. It began in the uh, days following the Civil War as Decoration Day, 
And there's a lot of mythology about where the first was, etc. But I can tell you that it was in Bowlesburg, Pennsylvania. Don't believe any of the other stuff. That is myth. On July 4th, 1864. And the longest running parade was in Doylestown, Pennsylvania. Whether or not they're going to be able to replicate that this year, I guess, is still an open question. But some town in Wisconsin said they had one first. Don't believe that either. But at 3 o'clock on Monday, take a moment, if you can, to pause and quietly reflect upon those who gave so much to preserve and protect and defend the freedoms that we enjoy. And if you're able to find one of those poppies that were ubiquitous when I was a kid, please buy one and wear one as we honor those who gave their lives for this great nation. But for now, have a great weekend and let that be the best 60-ish seconds of your week.